Regina Carter. Kaylin McKinney. Straight ahead. You want to hear one more? One more? Okay, one more. A couple different meanings. It means a style of music which is like swing, and it also has to do with certain types of changes that were especially evolved during the bebop era. And it usually it means like no nonsense and going straight forward. And we felt that that was the kind of music that we were committed to playing, and that was the type of attitude we had about ourselves and our progress. And it also had a name that didn't really have like any kind of uh, gender connotations. Ken Cox has a firm reputation in the international jazz community. He's seen Straight Ahead develop into a tight little band, but says they're not finished just yet. I believe that, that, that uh, this group is as young as they are in, in years, uh, certainly will, um, as they continue to work together and to grow and, and perform and, and work it out um, as, as a unit become, um, pretty much a model uh, ensemble uh, because they work well together uh, both on and off the bandstand and uh, they're developing you might say a common uh, a musical identity as an ensemble that in itself is kind of unique. You talked something about jazz being a reflection of the popular music of the time as well as having its own integrity but I'm wondering um, if each of you can give some kind of sense of how you see yourselves fitting into the tradition of the music through your instrument. Eileen? 
Let's start with Miriam. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I have to say that um, the Detroit, being in Detroit, I've been very fortunate to, to be privy to a, a long line of very f fine basses that come from the tradition of uh, playing as a, playing in the rhythm section of the of the of the jazz of jazz groups. That is generally with a piano and a drummer and and the, and the bass, and that um, I've been able to be privy to that kind of feel of, of a swing, the swing feel of jazz, but also I've been privy to things like the Motown sound uh, with the James Jameson who was like just kind of a similar figure in, in making that sound what it is and the importance that it's been for the music, uh, for the music today even. Marcus Belgrave is one of the finest jazz trumpeters working today. He has nurtured much of the new Detroit talent, and some of those players have gone on to international fame. The development has been fantastic. At, at one period, she I think she quit playing when she went to school. Well, at least she, uh, she was off the scene for uh, about four years, but she went up to the University of Michigan. But um, she was uh, at... And when she was in high school, she was a great, great player. But I heard her and heard her, her sound and the potential of her sound and the potential of her playing, and she just became a natural, you know, natural member of my group, the first group I had in the tribe. to reflect all parts of, of the music, the James Jameson sound that I grew up hearing, the Ray Brown sound, the Ron, the Ron Carter sound, the Jaco Pastorius, and, and I feel like there's a combination of that in the kind of music that we do here in Straight Ahead, because we'll do some uh, Duke Jordan, some George Duke, but then we'll also do some Eddie Harris, and we'll do some of everything, so that, we, so that I have a chance to kind of mix all those different elements together and then bring those into music that we do right now. I think it's a real important thing it's in terms of uh, keeping the music alive and keeping it functional in the community and keeping people who are interested in hearing it too. You feeling like that, Galen? I am, um, well, you know, my, my roots are very deep rooted in, in uh, bebop. Um, my uncle, my uncle yeah. Ray and, and my father, Harold McKinney, and my mother, they're all musicians there. My mother sings. And I uh, had a lot of drummers who came through the house and, and, and you know, instilled that, that music and that the, how, to, how to play it. Danny Spencer made a name for himself by touring extensively with jazz masters like Joe Henderson, Art Farmer, Dexter Gordon, and countless others. He's also been a drum instructor, and while teaching at Oakland University in suburban Detroit, noticed Gay Lynn had something special. Well, first of all, I knew uh, uh, something about uh, Gay Lynn's uh, family, which I think it was about four generations of uh, jazz musicians. So from the early inceptions of jazz until Gay Lynn, you know, they've, they've, they've been an ongoing musical family. She's a, uh, seemed to show a lot more curiosity than uh, most of my students at Oakland University where she was a student of mine. Like I say, that curiosity uh, is a real strong factor in, in uh, getting through your formative uh, musical years. You have the opportunity to express to it to express your musical words in jazz, you know, more than to me more than any other music. Pick it up the jam. A violin is a very rare instrument in the jazz idiom. We have uh, Stuff Smith, Ray Nance, Billy Bang, Jean Lux, Finn Amison, and Stefan Grappelli. So with those few individuals, they all have their individual style. And this enabled me to draw certain characteristics from their style, but also to keep, to create my own style. 
so that I'm not sounding like another violinist per se. And I've listened to a lot of um, Charlie Parker and I try and draw from horn players because basically those are the normal, if you want to say instruments in jazz, and jazz, and I want to get that, the phrasing from the horn players because violin you usually think of as a symphonic instrument and a very syrupy kind of instrument, but it doesn't have to be. Regina has uh, uh, grasped the language uh, of this idiom very quickly because uh, she's, you know, performed uh, with the EMX and she's performed with the Gorillas and she's performed with the, uh, the uh, Detroit Jazz Orchestra and she's had ever so many experiences in a very short time. I, I think, you know, uh, certainly, she's going to be a very important artist in the uh, on an on an international level. People think that if you can just play classical music, that you, you can easily switch over and play jazz, which you can't, because that's a whole other music and form and style in itself. And it's been difficult, and not that I've mastered it, and I never will, no one ever does, but that's the joy of it, is to keep trying to master it, but... It requires sort of like two different mindsets. It does. Your mind has to be different, right? It does. What, what, what are the points or the elements drawing on the classical experience that are really different well, when you're going to jazz? First of all, jazz is very... Impro improvisational music and classical basically it's just written on the page and if you have a piece by Bach you have to play it in the style that he wrote it in period no matter what you can't if I feel sad today I can't interpret his partita as being sad today it has to be played in in the characteristic or the style that he wrote it in whereas if I'm doing a blues piece or if I'm doing any kind of jazz piece if I feel sad today that's how I can play it it's my interpretation of the music can you get to the concept, Eileen, that there's something about creating yourself? When you sit down at the keyboard, you're not just doing somebody's tune or trying to get another feeling into it. You're mm -hmm. really, you're creating yourself all over again when you play. Mm -hmm. is, you think that's so? That is true. Um, and what you're creating is really your highest self. When she was talking about the transition that people experience, um, going from one form of music into jazz, what you have to, we all have many selves and we have layers of ourselves. And when you're doing something like jazz, which is a really pure uh, art, you have to get through a lot of other layers to your purest self to let it out or to, to let it be. Jazz master Ray McKinney forged his reputation during 20 years of living and playing in New York. His solid bass playing enhanced the lineups of Max Roach, Donald Byrd, Barry Harris, Yusuf Latif, naming a few. Since returning to his native Detroit, Ray has seen and contributed to the musical development of Straight Ahead's Eileen Orr. I am very encouraged by people like Eileen because she of her background, I mean, the background that she came from was not one of jazz, and she came into this picture, and the jazz, wanting to play the music, really caused her to really study the instrument in a way that uh, some people who are born into it, so, uh, so, so to speak, never do. Uh, she's still at it, of course, but a phenomenal progress, I would call it. What you do in the process of learning jazz, uh, if you come from another culture, is that you learn about the culture and you learn where it came from. So I played blues, and I played in a couple of Baptist churches, and I learned the idiom, and I have I still consider myself to be an artist in development, but you learn the vocabulary. Um, and it's a trick because you have, it's like learning the language. And even as a child, like when you learn a language, you learn it by rote. Your parents teach you dog, shoe, cat. And then eventually you speak your own way. And it's the same way with jazz. There's a lot of preparation. People think that you just get up there and make a lot of noise on an instrument. But um, the more that you know about it, you realize that it's, uh, like technique uh, frees up your musical thought. So the more um, you work on your technique and your knowledge of the idiom, the freer you become. Well, I told her in the beginning it would take about 10 years before you actually began to get really comfortable with the idiom. 
And within about a 10 year period, she began to show this real uh, strong, uh, this, this what I would say, the authority uh, that you really need to become a good improvisational musician. And she's come very far along, and I'm very, very happy to know her because of that. I mean, she's been a very uh, welcome addition to Detroit's roster of good pianists.
we've had some years now together working as a band. Mm. And I'm wondering if you can give me some sense of what kind of things you have found on, in retrospect, necessary and important to the seasoning of the band. In the process of doing this music, we became very good friends. And, and we had a lot of acceptance. If somebody came in with an idea, it could be half formed, or you weren't really quite sure how it was going to go over or something, we felt very free to just set it out there. And we've almost never had anyone just come in and say, this is the tune, this is how it's going to go, and we play. And we'd be just like, well, how about this? Well, I think this would sound good there. And like, what you hear is just kind of like a mix of all of our styles come together. And I think that, um, I think that all of us um, had certain attitudes like, oh, we didn't want to be an inaugural band when the idea was first presented to us because we didn't want to get put in a bag. But it actually has been a very self-affirming thing for us because we've had a lot of uh, freedom to just do what we want. And I know there's a lot of music that would probably still be sitting in drawers or up in somebody's head if we wouldn't have had this particular forum to, to, to do that music. Mm -hmm. So acceptance of one another, mm -hmm. where you were, that's one of the elements to making you all this little solid mm -hmm. group. What, what else? Mm -hmm. Well, go ahead. I, th I think also, you know, along with that acceptance, I think that there's some kinds of business things that we learned about that were, that were very important because I, I know particularly for me, working as a side, uh, a side man during most of my life, I had not had a chance to really be in on things like making decisions about jobs, making decisions about repertoire, which are, which are really important aspects in making a, making a um, band function as a unit. And so, you know, our, our system has always been very cooperative. Um, we've always um, split funds down the middle. We've split responsibilities. Sometimes different people will book jobs. That's been very important.
my goal was just to play music and be able to travel and just enjoy life and and spread my music to other people and joy or whatever people get from my music that's good just to be able to continue to do that music is a is a is a mission it's kind of a a mission of communication and it's a way that that I can um, to can communicate my ideas and so I feel that the longer I'm in it the more I want to expose a, a greater amount of number of people to to these ideas and I also feel like it's a it's a cultural mission I feel like it's a cultural mission for uh, for of women and also for black black people. I think that's a cultural mission for women because I remember when I was coming up, I didn't have any role models at all for playing this instrument. And I think that you know, if we want to continue to encourage um, other women to seek to seek uh, involvement in music outside of the vocal tradition, that there has to be role models there where people can say that you can be this. And it doesn't have to do with um, any any other anything like you don't have to be a gay woman to do it. You don't have to be a straight woman to do it. You don't have to be a poor woman. You can be a middle class woman. You can be a high class woman. You can. It doesn't matter with economic stratification. It doesn't matter where you came from. You can come from a small town. But if you have an interest in this, then you can then you can do this. And in terms of the group, I I, I do hope that the group will be able to. Um, share the music that we've been able to um, incubate from our experiences here and abroad with uh, the world community. I think that we'll be able to do that very soon. Okay.